Good morning. Welcome to the now third episode of Pyramid Knitting, a podcast about knitting and natural dyeing and other uh, crafty projects or garden projects I have going. Um, my name is Liz. I am coming to you from my home outside of Taos, New Mexico. Um, hmm. I know I didn't really write out my intro this time. So I guess I was going to talk about my knitting mojo. Um, because I've talked in the last couple of episodes about how it's been a pretty rough year for me this last year. Um, my mother passed away from pancreatic cancer and I also got divorced. Um, and somewhere in there, bought a house and adopted a dog and am doing all, all the life changes. <laughs> um, and I really thought during that whole time of transition that I was just going to be knitting and knitting and knitting and just like knitting my way through a really difficult time. And I did. Um, I did knit a lot uh, during my whole transition time. But it's like now that I've finally kind of gotten settled, you know, I'm settled back in my house and, I'm, um, you know, things are starting to move forward instead of being stuck in this sort of washing machine turmoil <laughs> time. Um, yeah, now that things are settled, all I want to do is knit. And I'm just like getting... I, I want to say obsessed with knitting, but I'm already obsessed with knitting, like excessively obsessed with knitting. Um, like it's just all I want to be doing all the time. I wake up in the morning and it's like, oh, I want to go and work on that project. Um, I've been uh, filling in at the yarn shop here in town uh, this month while one of the ladies is out of town. So I've been, you know, feeding my knitting addiction through that for sure. And also I started this podcast. So, you know, it's like, it's on my mind more, but I'll go and work in the yarn shop all day. I'll be around yarn all day. I'm talking to people about knitting all day. I'm knitting at work all day, working on samples and things. And I come home and the first thing I want to do is like, dog, go outside. I need to unwind and knit for a few minutes. <laughs> like, it's just the first thing I want to do when I get home. Um, and then it's like, well, I guess I have to eat something. So I'll like make myself something really quick and just immediately start knitting again. Cause it's just all I want to be doing. Um, and I think it's a healing process. I think I've kind of hit that point where my body or my brain is kind of naturally taking over and saying, you need to do this. This is going to help you process things and help you get through things. And, you know, there's plenty of studies out there that show, you know, the mind state that you get into whenever you're knitting actually reflects the mind state you get into whenever you meditate. Um, and I am a meditator as well. Um, and I haven't been meditating. <laughs> I have not been meditating at all lately. Um, and I know I need to. Uh, and I don't really feel bad that I'm not doing it right now because I just kind of know that I'm just not quite there yet. You know, um, very slowly, like everything is starting to build back up in my life that I used to be really, um, I don't want to say attached to or identified with, but kind of attached to and identified with. Um, you know, I always identified myself as a gardener and like, I'm finally getting my plants going again. Um, and yeah, I keep showing you guys every week. They get a little bit bigger. I up of my tomatoes. They're gigantic now. They're like, I don't know, probably four times the size they were the last time I recorded, like two weeks ago. Um, and I'll flip you around here because I moved a bunch of stuff. But you can see I've got uh, lettuces and arugula going and my amaryllis are just going crazy. Um, and I've got some crazy succulents going on too. And I've got other, I've got a bunch of herbs in the kitchen now that I just um, up potted out of their little one inch cells. Um, I've got this big pot of basil going now and some sage and some parsley. And anyway, my point is I'm getting my hands back in the dirt, even if it is just container dirt. 
um, but it feels like coming back into myself and reconnecting with myself. So I'm getting back into that. I'm really getting back into knitting. Same kind of thing. It's a tactile thing. You're using your hands. It helps you reconnect back into your body, reconnect back to yourself. So I'm getting there. And I'm not too worried that I'm not keeping a regular meditation practice. Like I know I should, I know you shouldn't say should. Um, I know would help me. I know is good for me, but I'm, I'm taking my own time. I'm not forcing anything. I'm not making myself feel bad because I'm not doing enough. I'm just doing what feels right for me right now. And right now I feel like knitting all the time. <laughs> yeah. So lots of knitting. Um, lots of healing, lots of processing going on here. First finished object I am wearing. This is my uh, Cullum top by Isabel Kramer. And I knit it up in Knit Picks Cotland in the colorway Blackberry. And I talked about this shirt in the first episode, in the second episode, but um, I kind of explained the story behind it in the first episode. Um, I had cast the sweater on or shirt on um, about three or four days before my mother passed away. Um, and I was there with her, I was sitting with her. So I was sitting with her in her final days knitting this top. I made it kind of to through the lace um, and then she passed away and then I put the shirt away and I didn't work on it for a while. Um, and I tried to pick it back up a couple of times and kept messing up and would put, put it back down. And um, finally, you know, a couple months later, got back to it and I finished it. I finished it the other day. Um, super exciting. I'll stand up. I might, I'll have to figure out how to show this appropriately. But there's a little lace detail here down on the bottom as well. Um, that's just on the front. The back is just all stocking at. But I really like the shirt. It's super cute. Um, it ended up being a really good fit. And I really love the way that the neckline is sitting. Um, they had you go back through and pick up all the stitches around the neckline. And what was it? You knit one row, purl one row, bind off. Um, and it just makes it sit so well. It does this really nice little flat edge around the, the neckline. Um, and I just think it looks so nice and delicate and, um, yeah, so nice and delicate. And it's just a really lovely way to finish this off. Um, and make it look really, I don't know, classy, tailored, whatever. I like it. <laughs> um, so I'm really, really happy that I finished this. Um, and I finished it actually the night before my dad came into town. Um, so I got to wear it whenever he got to town. And I don't know that seemed special to me. The one thing that I don't really like about this top is the sleeves kind of do this weird little flare up thing. And that is totally because of the yarn I picked. It's nothing to do with the pattern. Um, I'm pretty sure it was written for fingering weight and this is actually a DK weight yarn. Um, it's supposed to be, you know, a really nice, light, airy, loose summer top. And I wanted a little bit more structure to it. I didn't want to have to wear a shirt underneath. Um, so it's a thicker yarn. It's a sturdier yarn. I think the sample they did was like in a Quince and Company linen blend or something. Um, and it's got actual seams along the shoulder. So it just kind of the seam just holds its structure and it doesn't really fall down. I feel like after I wear it a little bit and maybe wash it a couple of times that that stiffness isn't going to stay and it'll, it'll lay flatter. Uh, but that's the only thing I don't like about this top. Otherwise I totally love it. It's great. Um, I think it's definitely going to be a wardrobe staple, um, in the spring and in the fall. Um, you know, it, it is a DK, so it's a little bit warmer. Um, you know, it's not wool, it's a cotton linen, so it's still a cool summer top, but it is kind of thick. Um, so it's, it'll be really good for, you know, kind of those in-between days that are a little bit warm. Um, and that's my only finished object this week, but I think that's a big one. This is like a milestone that I finished it and cathartic that I finished it. 
So yeah, I had also said about this top that I got this yarn on sale, um, which is why I got it because I don't really like purple. It's not my favorite color. But the yarn was on sale, so I got it. Um, but my mom's favorite color was purple, so it was very fitting and very touching that, you know, this kind of ended up being her shirt um, that I was working on whenever she was sick. So, kind of, I don't know, ironically, obviously, I, <laughs> I don't know which, uh, <laughs> which descriptor I should use, um, but my mom didn't always love purple. My grandmother loved purple. That was her favorite color. And then after my grandmother died, my mother was really into purple and just bought all the purple things because that was her mom's favorite color and it became very sentimental to her. So now, as we're moving on, um, now my mother has also passed and I didn't like purple, but all of a sudden now I'm really liking purple. And I was working in the yarn shop and I was working on the sample knit, um, the, the scarf, which was the sample knit uh, I'm working on for the yarn shop, which I'll show you after this one. Um, and it's kind of a doozy of a pattern. It's a, it's a challenging, you know, you got to think about it pattern. And I wanted something that I could kind of mindlessly knit while I was there too, because if that was the only project I had to work on while I was there, like I was just going to lose my mind. And I really wanted to work with the... Juniper Moon Harriet Fine yarn, which is a oh, um, alpaca cashmere silk blend, I think. Let me try and peek at the tag. Oh no, I totally lied. It's baby alpaca with nylon. Um, anyway, it's really soft, and of course the color I picked was purple. <laughs> the colorway is Nazca Skies. And it's this really, really lovely purple. It's got all of these um, flecks of blue and red in it, and it's just got so much depth. Um, I just kind of couldn't resist it. And then I thought it was so funny because it's pretty much the exact same color as the shirt. I didn't do that on purpose. I didn't realize that until after I started knitting it for a minute. And I was like, wait a minute, I have another project on the needles that looks a lot like this. Um, so I found, I found a hat pattern in... Um, uh, one of the magazines was Vogue Knitting from like last fall, I think. It's the honeycomb hat. Um, so it's got a little honeycomb cable pattern there on a stockinette stitch background. Uh, one by one rib for the um, bottom. And I knit the bottom a little bit longer than the pattern called for because it's supposed to, the brim rolls up. And I wanted to have a little bit more depth to kind of cover up my ears more. Um, so it wasn't just like one inch rolled brim. It's going to be like two or three inches rolled brim. Um, because it is a very fine yarn. You know, you can see through it, but it's going to be super warm because it's alpaca and it's got this all over cable pattern. Um, so I think it's going to be a really good weight hat. Um, you know, lightweight hat, it'll still let some air flow through, but the pattern itself and the fiber itself are going to be really, really warm. Um, so yeah, purple is my new favorite color, apparently. <laughs> so this is my number one work in progress, which is a new one. Um, and I'm getting pretty close to being done with it. I've gotten through one, two, three, four, four and a half repeats of the pattern, I think. Um, and you do seven, uh, cable repeats before you start the decreases. So it's getting pretty close. Um, you know, it's not cold out yet. Um. It's not a super high priority project for me, but it's fun. Um, yeah, and the yarn is super, super soft, which is why I went into knit with it. And going through the one by one rib, I was just loving it. I was in love with this yarn. It felt so good. It felt so soft. It was knitting up so quickly. And then I got up to the cables and discovered that this yarn actually doesn't have a lot of give to it. Um, I'm not sure why alpaca doesn't have as much give, maybe? Which seems counterintuitive because whenever you block alpaca, it like really stretches out. Maybe it's the nylon content, I don't know. Um, but these cables are really pretty fiddly to do in this yarn because it's, it's a really tight yarn. 
Um, so that's kind of annoying, but it's going to be real nice when it's done. So that's number one. Um, okay. Moving on. Next up then would be the sample knit I am doing for the shop, which is a scarf made out of universal universe yarn, which I showed you last time. It's a cotton linen glitz blend. And it's just got all of this metallic running through it. Um, and I was not a fan of this yarn last time. I'm still not really a fan of this yarn, but I don't mind it as much now that I've been working with it. I was pretty concerned because I only had about this much done last time. Um, and it's a whole scarf and it was a challenging pattern. Uh, it has cables in it. It has lace in it. It has like kind of bobbles in it. Um, there's a lot going on in this pattern. Um, and I was really, really concerned about knitting a whole scarf, but thankfully it's been knitting up pretty quickly and check it out. Woo! It keeps going. It just keeps going. This thing is huge. It is so long already. I'm almost done. I am almost done with this. Um, I've got another... Uh, I think six inches to go on the, the main repeat. Um, and then there's a little different section at the beginning that you repeat at the end. Um, and then that's it. So I think I'm going to be done with this sometime this weekend. I have a couple of shifts in the yarn shop and I think I should be able to finish the knit this weekend. Um, and then I have to figure out how to block this thing. Um, if I had blocking wires, that would really help out. Um, I'm almost considering buying some just to have them anyway, because um, this is going to be a real challenge to block. Uh, and I have made a few mistakes in this pattern because that's a lot of knitting. That's a lot of knitting with a lot of stuff going on. Um, I've miscrossed a couple of cables, which... I'm really not concerned about it. I don't think you're going to notice it. Um, I messed up in the lace a couple of times, which, you know, a discerning eye could notice. But they're mostly way down towards the beginning, so I think it'll be pretty easy just to kind of how you wrap it around, you know, however we're going to display it. Just wrap that part underneath and no, nobody's going to notice. Um, but really, there's so much stuff going on in here that I really don't think, you know, a tiny mistake is gonna show all that much. So yeah, I'm actually enjoying this project now. Can you believe it? Um, and I've gotten used to working with the yarn. Uh, it's still a strange yarn to work with, but it's not driving me crazy like it kind of was the first time. I've gotten used to sort of the, the give of it and um, you know, the finesse you need to, to get underneath to do the cables um, with this yarn and everything. So I have done a knit along, sort of. I'm, I'm not good at doing knit alongs. <laughs> um, it was on the Reddit Ravelry group, I think. I think it was. It was a work in progress challenge. Um, and basically the way they broke it down was it was motivation to finish your works in progress. So if you had, you know, four or five different works in progress going, you would say this one week I'm working on project number one, the next week I'm working on project number two, next week project number three, and you would cycle through it. So you were sure to, you know, give equal attention to all of your works in progress and you would actually finish them. <laughs> um, and that was, seemed like a really good idea to me. And, you know, I had a couple of big projects going at the time, I'm sure. Um, and it did motivate me to work on things. Um, and you know, I didn't really hold myself accountable in the Ravelry group. I'm really, I'm really bad about <laughs> checking the forums and, you know, I didn't really follow the rules of the group, but it was a good exercise for myself to get things done. So I'm finding myself again with a ton of big projects that I'm working on and I've decided to start doing that again for myself and saying, this week I'm going to work on this project. This week I'm going to work on this project. 
this week I'm going to work on this project. And, you know, I have other projects, the smaller things. I'm just kind of working in the background and working on those whenever. But my bigger, like, sweater projects, I'm cycling through week to week. Um, so the first one I'm cycling through is my Cruden vest, which is a Farrell vest by Yasolda Teague. And the last time I showed you, I was only through the bottom ribbing, but I was just about to start the color work. So I have since started the color work and it is coming along very, very nicely. I'm very pleased with how this is um, knitting up and how the colors are working. And my tension is not terrible, which, um, you know, is always a struggle with Fair Isle. And I am not the most accomplished Fair Isle knitter, um, but I am getting better. I am getting better at it. Um, I've been holding my work inside out while I've been knitting on it. So I've been knitting with the needles on the far side for me so that the outside is facing, or the inside of the sweater is facing to the outside. Um, and that's just a little, gives you a little bit extra um, circumference around with the floats. Does that make sense? So that it's not on the inside, you know, it's not scrunched up, it's going around the outside. So it just helps you a little bit more with not pulling your floats too tight. Because then when you turn it right side, you know, you have a little bit of extra give. Um, and that's something I generally always try and do uh, with Fair Isle. Whenever I'm doing like yoked sweaters, I'll usually flip it inside out once I get up to the yoke um, and work the color work that way. Uh, because it just helps a little bit. This week is a Cruden week, so I'll be working on this all this week. Um, so hopefully I'll get some some good progress done on that. Um, I had wanted this to be done for Taos Wool Fest, which is the first weekend of October. That's not going to happen. I didn't really realistically think that was going to happen. It just would have been a nice miracle should that have happened. <laughs> but it's not. So the other project that I'm cycling back and forth between my Cruden vest, I have now cast on my Oma Gang, um, which last time I had done the swatch for, I showed you guys the swatch with the cable and the stockinette. Um, so I cast it on and this pattern is really kind of interesting the way it's written. Normally you would see patterns written, you knit the body and then you knit the sleeves and then you join the sleeves to the body and then you knit the yoke. Like that's pretty standard construction. This pattern actually tells you to cast on the sleeves first and knit the sleeves first and then knit the body. Um, and it's an asymmetrical tunic. So like one side of the body has cables on it and the other side is stockinette. One sleeve has cables on it and the other side is stockinette. So the way this pattern is written, they tell you to knit the stockinette sleeve first, then the cable sleeve, then work the body. So I think they're just... <laughs> trying to kind of like ease you into it because it's a pretty big project. It's a lot of cabling, it's complicated. So they tell you to start with the easy part and work your way up. So, you know, I mean, there's no real reason to knit the sleeves first or the body first, but I'm just doing what the pattern says. So I cast on my stockinette sleeve. I've been working on it. It's uh, up above my elbow. So that's doing pretty good. And I, oh my God, the fit is so good. I keep trying it on and I'm just like, this sleeve is perfect. It's like the perfect sleeve. Um, and I had reworked the math on this to fit my proportions um, and it's working out. It's working out great. So this was my project for last week and this will be my project for next week. I'm sure I'll finish this sleeve and start on the second one the next week that I'm working on my Oma Gang project. Um, so that's it for this so far. My other big work in progress, which I'm not cycling through the weeks with this one because it's already mostly done. Um, and I just want to finish it. So I'm just working on it in the background. And I had showed you this on the first episode, I believe. It's Wolf River. Um, I had started knitting it last winter and I knit the body and the sleeve and realized the sleeve was too small, um, which is very unusual for me. Usually sleeves are too big for me and I have to rework the decreases uh, because if I fit to my upper arm, it's going to be way too big on my wrist. 
uh, because I have a really large discrepancy between my wrist and my shoulder. Skinny wrists, bigger shoulders. Um, so it was kind of odd that the sleeve was actually too small for me. That never happens. Usually sleeves are too big and I have to rework for more decreases or rework it to be smaller at the wrist, you know. So this is the only time that I've had to make a sleeve bigger, which um, is interesting to note for this pattern. <laughs> so I finally went and tore out the sleeve. I knit it back out now in the larger size. So the first sleeve is totally done. And I have started in on the second sleeve, which is now about half done. So this doesn't have too much more to go. Um, it's knit in uh, Cascade Eco Wool, which I'm not sure if that's considered an Aran or a bulky weight. Um, I think it's bulky weight. So it, it's thick yarn, you know, it knits up pretty quickly. So I just have to finish up the sleeve and then cast on for the neckline and do the ribbing for the neckline and that's it. Um, and it's all done with the tubular bind off and tubular cast on, which I am a big fan of. Um, it's just such a nice little detail. Um, you know, it makes it look like the stitches just don't start or end. They just go over the edge and meld into each other. Um, I'm a really big fan of that technique. It does take a bit of work and it took me, you know, several times of doing projects with a uh, tubular cast on to be able to read the cast on because it's really easy to flip the stitches around the needle on the cast on. Um, but once you kind of get used to it and you know what the knits and the purls look like with that particular cast on, um, then it's a lot easier to, whenever you're going back through and knitting the first row, to realize if your stitches have flipped around or not. Um, and that took me a few times of doing projects before I really got that down. But, you know, now that I have it down, it's simple, like anything. You know, you practice it and it's easy. Now I can tell you about my tip for the day. Um, and this was actually something that I picked up from uh, Yasolda Teague's blog few years back at this point, it is for counting rows. And it's another one of those obvious things that once you know how to do it, you'll always do it. So basically, every time you do an increase or a decrease, you just lay a piece of scrap yarn in between the stitches. So you'll do your increase row, and then when you start the next row, you lay scrap yarn in between the stitches. And then the scrap yarn will lay on the actual increase row as you keep knitting forward. And then, you know, you knit however much. This particular one I'm doing every six rows 19 times. So then you knit six rows, you do your increase. Then when you start the next row, you just lay the scrap yarn across the stitches again. Knit six, lay it back the other way. Knit six, lay it back the other way. And then it becomes super, super easy to one, count how many increases you've done so far, just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, I think I'm up to 13. And it becomes super easy to count the rows that you're on until your next increase or decrease. Um, you know, there was a time when I, before I started doing this, where I would, you know, keep a tally mark on a piece of paper, like how many increases I'd done or how many decreases I'd done. And then I would always second guess myself, like, did I mark it the last time? Did I mark it twice? And then I'd always be going back and like trying to read the stitches and find the increase and count back. And it just always ended up being a pain in the neck. Um, so now this is always what I do. It's so super easy. And then whenever you're done with it, you could just pull it out. You just pull the string out and it's done. As I was saying um, last time, I think that whenever I was going through that transitionary time in the last year that I didn't want to knit for anybody else. I just wanted to do selfish knitting and knit for myself. Um, and I just didn't have the motivation to make gifts for anyone. Um, and I'm finding now that I'm coming back into myself and starting to move forward again, that 
I really wanted it for other people. I keep wanting to do gifts. Um, and, you know, working in the yarn shop, you have a lot of time to wander around and look at yarn <laughs> and, you know, stock Ravelry and look at patterns and think about projects you might want to make and, you know, think about people you might want to make projects for. And I was working at the shop one day and I just suddenly was like, I need to knit something for this friend of mine. Um, it just came to me. I was like, I, ha I have to knit something. So I went and I looked through um, the patterns I had saved on Ravelry and I found a pattern from Kate Davies that I had saved, which is Highland Rogue. And it's a snood, um, which is basically just a gigantic circular scarf. Um, it's super wide, super long. Like you can probably wrap it around your neck like three times. It looks super cozy. <laughs> um, and I just knew like that's, that's the project that I had to make for my friend. And I don't know why I thought a giant scarf was going to be a good idea given all of the other projects that I have going, but for some reason I did. And this, this friend and I have both been going through a really rough time in the last year. Um, you know, we haven't been going through the same things, but we've been going through a lot of tumult and transition and life changes. And we've both been a really big support to each other through that time. Um, and I just wanted to make something to give, you know, the gift of a hug <laughs> to, to that friend, you know, and know that whenever they wore it in the winter that, you know, I was thinking of them. So I started wandering around the shop and trying to find a yarn <clears throat> and I found some tweed that I was really kind of into. I've been wanting to knit with tweed, I think, cause it feels like starting to feel like fall. Um, but I didn't think that this particular pattern, it's like a knit and pearl sort of textured pattern. I thought the tweed might be too much and kind of detract from the, the texture and the pattern and it wouldn't read real well. So I kept looking and then I found this Ella Ray Cozy Alpaca in the sale bin. <laughs> so I was pretty intrigued by this. It felt super soft and the tag said it was machine washable alpaca blend. Um, and this colorway I believe is called Campfire. It's a nice rust color, very fall. Um, but it said machine washable alpaca blend. And I was like, that would be great for a gift because you don't ever really know whenever you're gifting somebody something, if they're going to accidentally felt it, um, or if they're not going to use it because they're afraid of the care instructions, you know, they're worried they have to wash it by hand. So then they just never use it. And I want people to use things that I give them. Um, so I went and I looked the yarn up on Ravelry to get some more information about it. And it was listed as an Aran weight, which seemed strange to me. It doesn't look that thick. Um, it looks like a worsted, um, maybe even a light worsted to me. And the pattern called for a DK. And you know, it's a scarf, so gauge doesn't really matter. I figured it'd probably be fine. Um, and it said to knit on size eight needles. And DK on eight seemed kind of counterintuitive to me. Like that's a pretty big needle for a slightly thinner yarn. I would think DK would be more like a five or a six. Um, but I figured, you know, it's an eight, like that an eight would probably work well for this yarn. Um, and it also listed the fiber contents as 70% um, acrylic and 30% alpaca which is a really high acrylic content. And I was kind of turned off by that because I like to use natural fibers. I like to gift natural fibers um, because they're great. <laughs> so I didn't really want to knit in an acrylic, um, but it felt really soft. It doesn't feel like an acrylic yarn. It feels like an alpaca yarn. So I went ahead and went for it because it was in the sale bin too. So I cast on on eights and knit a couple repeats of the pattern and discovered that it was super, super loose. I did not like the look of it. Um, the transition between the knits and the pearls was like getting really stretched out and like the stitches were just really wide and it looked really sloppy. And, you know, I was really kind of questioning my uh, yarn choice. I was like, maybe I shouldn't have gotten this acrylic. Like, I don't think it's gonna work out. But I ripped it out and I was like, I'm gonna try a smaller needle size. 
and I didn't have any sevens readily available, but I had sixes readily available. So I was like, it was really loose on eights. Maybe it'd be okay on a six. So I went ahead and cast on, I made a couple repeats and I loved it. I love the look of this fabric. It's like a little bit tight to knit with on sixes. Um, it feels a little snug on the needles, but I'm loving the way the fabric is turning out. It's this nice, dense fabric. You can read the pattern really well. It's totally reversible on the front and the back, which is great for a scarf pattern. Um, and I'm knitting it as a scarf. I didn't do the provisional cast on to join it um, at the end because I just think that the scarf version would suit this friend's style better. Um, and I saw some other people on Ravelry had done it as a scarf and it looked really nice. Um, so you can see it's very wide. It's going to be very long. <laughs> Um, you know, I've made some decent progress, but uh, it's a big project. And, you know, for some reason I thought that would be a good idea. But I am really, really loving knitting this design. Um, you know, it's just knits and pearls, so it's simple. Uh, it's a 10 stitch repeat and a six row repeat. Um, and as I'm kind of getting into it a little bit more, I'm not having to refer to the pattern all that much. Um, so I think after a couple more times, I'm gonna have this pattern like totally memorized. Um, and it's knitting faster as I'm memorizing the pattern more and I'm falling, falling into that rhythm. It's like a mantra rhythm um, of doing this repetitive, you know, it's not just like knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one. Like, you know, there's more going on to it than just that. Um, so it's really, it's mentally engaging, but you can also kind of zone out on it too. Um, which is a fantastic meditative knit, which is exactly what I need right now. So um, it's a big project. I hope that I finish in some sort of reasonable time. <laughs> uh, but I'm really going to enjoy working on this project and knitting this project. I think it's going to be it's going to be a healing project for me, which I think is all the better to give to this friend who has been such a help to me over the last year. Um, and I hope that I am just as much um, a fountain of support. So yeah, so that's all of my works in progress. Okay, so now I can move on to In the Queue. In the Queue. Um, I had talked last time about wanting to design my own sweater using the Elizabeth Zimmerman percentage system. And I said I had already picked out the yarn and I had already picked out the color, but I hadn't bought it yet. Um, and sitting in the yarn shop all day, every day, <laughs> I finally went and I bought it. Um, it is also Juniper Moon. I'm knitting my hat in the Juniper Moon Harriet Fine. This is the Juniper Moon Moonshine, which this is an alpaca cashmere silk blend. I'm pretty sure. Let me double check. Double check. And I got it wrong on the other one. So make sure I get it right on this one. Baby alpaca. Oh, I, saw, I see, I got it wrong yet. Baby alpaca wool and silk blend. But it is just beautiful. And I love this color. It's this nice deep green, but it's not super saturated. Like it could almost push a little bit gray, almost. I mean, it's obviously a green, but I'm kind of in love with this yarn. It's very nice. Um, it's a single ply, which is gonna be interesting. Um, I'm kind of hoping that I can do a, maybe like three inches positive ease or something. Um, and since it is a single ply, it's going to have a little bit of a bias twist, which I think is actually going to work really well for my body. Um, I really like bias cut garments on me. Like they, they fit me really well. Um, so I think this yarn is actually going to work out great. So I did my swatch the other day. I was uh, playing around with needle size. Here's another little tip if you're swatching with multiple needle sizes, do a bunch of yarn overs to indicate your needle size. So this top portion is on seven, so I have seven yarn overs there. The second portion is on sixes, so I have six yarn overs there. Because, you know, you're never gonna remember what you did on your swatch. <laughs> and that's a nice way to kind of build it into the swatch. Um, and I also tested out a little broken rib pattern that I was thinking about doing for the um, hems. 
I'm not sure if I totally love it. Like, it doesn't read super well in this yarn because it is a single ply, so it doesn't have a ton of definition. Um, I do kind of just like the, the texture it gives. It doesn't really read like a broken rib the way I had envisioned it, so I don't know. I might stick with it just because it does still look nice. It just isn't what I expected. Um, or maybe I'll just do a one by one rib. We'll see. <laughs> so I've done the swatch. I haven't measured it. I haven't, I haven't blocked the swatch yet either. That's why it keeps rolling in on itself. Um, so I need to block the swatch, measure it, and then sit down with a pen and some paper and start doing some math and trying to figure out um, exactly what I want to do with the sweater, what kind of details I want to add to it. Um, if I want to do the broken rib, if I want to do one by one rib, uh, how much ease I want to give it, like how loose of a fit do I want? Do I want it to, you know, come in and kind of hug at the hem or do I want it to be more open and flowing? Like I'm really having fun just thinking about it <laughs> and thinking about the things I could do. Um, so I really hope that whenever I do cast that on that it turns out well, <laughs> uh, because that's going to open up a whole new range of possibilities for me, like actually coming up with my own clothes designs and making them for myself and not having to rely on somebody else's pattern. Um, you know, like finding a yarn that I love and not having to scour and find a pattern that's going to fit that yarn, but just being able to create something from that point forward. Um, it's a really exciting prospect. Uh, I think it's going to be a challenge, but I think I can do it. Like I've made enough garments for myself now that I understand what's going on. I understand the construction. I understand uh, where I want ease, where I don't want ease. I understand more fitting things to my body as well. Um, so I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So that's my uh, next in the queue. And I have another, <laughs> another idea for another sweater. Um, so I mentioned at the very beginning that my dad came up to visit uh, last week. Um, and I had just finished this, this top right before he got into town. So he came up to visit because he is moving to Taos. I'm gonna have my dad in town. <laughs> um, I think it'll be really great to have him close by, um, to have family so close. Um, I haven't had family close by in you know years and years. Uh, my brother lives in Colorado, so I'm much closer to him now than I was whenever I was up in Oregon, but, you know, he's still a few hours away. Um, so I think it'll be really helpful for me to have my dad here. I think it'll be helpful for my dad to be close to me. Um, I'll be able to, you know, help him out with things and he can help me out with things and it'll be good. Uh, but he lives in central Texas now and it doesn't really get all that cold there. <laughs> You know, and this Taos is up in the mountains and he's going to be moving to the mountains. Um, he put an offer on a house whenever he was here last week. I forgot to say that. Um, and they accepted the offer. So now they're doing all of the inspections and everything. So it's like, it's not a done deal yet. Nothing's closed yet, but it's all in process. So I had the idea that, you know, the, the way the timing should work out, if everything works smoothly, he should be moving up here like around Christmas or New Year's. So I think like, that would be a perfect Christmas present to give him a wool sweater because he's moving in the winter <laughs> from Texas up to the mountains. Like that, that would be great to do. So I've picked out a pattern. Um, I picked the pattern mostly for the name. I mean, it's going to be a good pattern for him. I think it, it's classic. It's got some texture. It's kind of like a classic sort of Gansey uh, pattern. It's also by Isabel Kramer. Uh, which this top was also by Isabel Kramer. Um, it's called Jaden, which my dad also just adopted a dog right around the time that I adopted a dog, and his dog's name is Jaden. So it's not spelled the same as this pattern, but I was scrolling through the patterns, you know, for men's sweaters and saw Jaden, and I was like, oh my God, I really hope this works because that would be so great to knit the Jaden pattern for my dad, whose dog's name is Jaden. Um, and I think it'll, I think it's going to work right. So I was looking around the yarn shop for yarn I could use on it. And we just didn't have a lot of selection in 
I, I wanted to do either a worsted tweed or a heather. And I thought tweed might be a little bit too much for my dad. So I'd like to do it in a heather um, because I think that would look really nice with the, the texture pattern. And it also gives some more, um, some not texture, uh, color texture going on in the stockinette part of the body. And looking at other people's projects, I really liked all of the heathered projects, the ones that were using a solid yarn. I didn't like quite as much. So I wanted to do a worsted and a heather, um, which we don't have anything in the yarn shop in enough quantity. And even with my discount, the ones that might've worked, it was gonna be like really pretty expensive for a men's sweater. You know, I think I'm gonna have to make the extra large size. Um, and like, I know it's a gift for my dad, but I still gotta keep on a budget. <laughs> um, so I think I'm gonna end up getting Knit Picks, Wool of the Andes uh, in Superwash because that was the other thing. Like I have to give my dad Superwash because he will definitely felt it. Most definitely, <laughs> like he's gotta have a super wash. Um, so I think that's gonna be my best combo of the color that I want with the um, color treatment that I want, the heathering, uh, with the washability that I want, with the affordability that I want. So I'm gonna have to make that order soon um, to make that for him for Christmas. With all of these other projects going on and other gift knitting that I'm doing, um, I think I might be insane. But all I want to do right now is knit. So I'm just going to go for it and like see how much knitting I can get done. <laughs> so yeah, once once I get that yarn, I'm going to have to, you know, start cycling through like three weeks of big sweaters for my works in progress. And, you know, work on my Cruden one week, work on my Oma Gang one week, work on my Jaden one week, um, and just kind of work my way through. And I'm telling you about the sweater for my dad because I don't think he's ever gonna watch this. <laughs> so I think it's fine. And even if he does, he's not gonna make it this far in the episode, I bet. So it's okay. It'll be just between us. Um, yeah, so that's finished objects, works in progress, in the queue. I did do a little bit of dyeing this week. Um, I plan to do some more hopefully this afternoon, um, but let me go grab that. So yarn dyeing, natural dyeing, plant dyeing. <laughs> Um, I got a little bit done. Uh, I more dented, more dented another batch of yarn, um, and, uh, did some dyeing with the chemisa in my yard, which is now flowering, uh, which I talked about wanting to do last time because those were just about to, uh, flower. All the buds were out. Um, there's quite a bit going on in the yard right now. So I want to do like a full batch of this. I was just kind of testing out to sort of, uh, get my ratio right. And I did two to one, um, <laughs> uh, weight of wool to dye stuffs or dye stuffs to wool. It was two chemisa to one wool <laughs> is my point. Um, because it, it was fresh material. It's not dried. Um, and it turned out really, really bright. Look at that yellow. Oh my gosh. It's just like sunshine yellow. I love it. It is so pretty. And this is going to be a great under dye um, for indigo to get some green. Like that would be a beautiful green. Um, so I don't think I need to do two to one weight of goods because this turned out really, really saturated. Um, I think I can do one or one and a half, kind of depending how much of a saturated yellow I want to get. Um, so that's that's good that I don't have to use as much as I thought I was going to. Um, you know, and if I, because there was still a little bit of color in the dye pot um, and I cooked these, I did some mini skeins too to play with, uh, cooked these for an hour um, in the dye pot I cooked the <laughs> I cooked the chemisa for an hour and then I cooked the wool for an hour in the dye pot after I strained out the chemisa. And there was still a bit of color in the pot, so I just let it sit overnight um, just to soak up as much as it could. I wanted to see what I could get from it. Um, and there was still yellow in the pot, so I know I didn't totally exhaust um, the color potential. 
but this is as much as I could get on the yarn. So, you know, I think this is kind of like my peak color in the chemisa, which is pretty amazing. Um, and that I just have a bunch of it in my yard is fantastic. So yeah, I may, whenever I do a full batch, I think I might try and go a little bit lighter um, and get a little bit of a paler yellow uh, to get a paler green to go over with indigo, uh, which I don't have an indigo vat going. That's kind of on my list to do next week um, to get that started. That's been my natural dyeing for this week. Um, I am planning to do another batch mordanting um, and play around with some cochineal, do some cochineal over chemisa, cochineal over saxon, um, see if I can get some cool purples and uh, some cool like raspberry reds um, over the yellow, uh, which I had played, I had played with the cochineal over chemisa some last summer um, and I really liked the outcome of that. So I think I will try that again. So that's kind of it, I think. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for uh, joining me again this week. Please, you know, leave any comments or questions, uh, like and subscribe, all that business. You can find me on Instagram and Ravelry, also as Pyramid Knitting. And I very much enjoyed uh, chatting with you again today and telling you all of the things that I'm up to with my knitting and um, how knitting is a benefit in my life um, and helps me not just keep my hands occupied, but uh, helps me heal my brain and heal my heart. And I hope that it does the same thing for you. And that is all. And I will see you next time. Thank you. Bye.